Hello everyone, welcome to this video series on Cobweb. If you're from Nexus for the Nexus Research Program, or if you're one of Dr. Brad Bass's students, or if you're anyone who is actually looking to develop your research skills through an open access and wonderful software, welcome. So this is a video series. If you check this out on YouTube, there should be a playlist just for your learning. I'm assuming that we're starting from scratch here. So if you have learned any other method, this is the first part one fundamentals of cobweb. With that being said, I'll try to keep it short and get started. So firstly, this is what you'll see once you have installed cobweb. Firstly, you have the grid. Now grid is representing an area that you might have. This might be something that's physical. So for example, you might have an ecosystem within you know, the marine environment, or it could even be something that is metropolitan like Toronto. It doesn't necessarily have to be a physical type of thing either. For example, you can make it somewhat analogous to a certain area within, you know, the human body. Obviously, that's still physical, but the point is Cobweb is here to really interconnect those complex relationships so you're able to put each thing as a variable, right? So with that being said, I do want to say a lot of students sometimes have the misinterpretation that agents have to be something that is living, whether it's something like bacteria, right? But realistically speaking, it really does represent anything you want it to, as long as it has some sort of complicated or, you know, general relationship with something else. Now let's start off with the very fundamentals. I already talked about the grid being your environment. The second thing is these triangles. If you look at it closely, you'll see that these triangles have a colored dot in the middle. Now these color dots help you discern between, you know, certain classes of agents that you want as your variables. For example, it could be green standing for, you know, maybe green apples that are eaten by worms, which are red agents, right? So you can change the number of these agents and whatever you want. Now these squares are representing different types of foods. What does that mean? Well, coincidentally, you have this red worm, right? So this red worm might eat something else beyond apples and it eats the red. So that means if we click start, you'll see that these agents are moving quickly. You could change your speed on how fast they're moving, right? And if you want to not make it move that fast, you stop it, for example, you can click step. So it moves one step within the grid, right? One unit square. So as it's moving, you can see that they turn randomly. The point is that it's all random to somewhat simulate, you know, that randomization you might see in other research, like primary data um, collections. So with that being said, you can see that these agents, the yellow agent will eat the yellow square, the red will eat the red square, and they are typically by default going to eat their own color. Obviously, you can change this. Now, another thing you might realize is, hey, what about the black squares? The black squares are not foods, okay? The black squares in this case is called a stone. If you think about it this way, Dr. Brad Bass once told me a while ago, long time ago, that if you ran into a wall super fast, you will lose a lot of energy. But similarly within a system, usually whether it's like physics, you have a resistor in your circuit, or it's just something in the ecosystem that might also be taking away energy. This is something that takes away energy in your system. Maybe that is some sort of depletion, right? Depletion of something. It's representing something that acts as an inhibitor within your system. Maybe that's something that is resisting a certain drug effect and depleting certain resources, right? So with that being said, those are your fundamental units, okay? Now let's actually take a look at how to modify these elements. I want to emphasize that when you click on file to change the settings and you know your agents accordingly, you should click on modify simulation file, not modify simulation. Reason being that some students when they click on modify simulation, for some reason it somewhat changes the data. You might get a lot of error messages, whatever the case, just modify the simulation data, right? You could create new data, you can open an old project you had as long as it's a .xml, right? And then you could save your sample population, you could log it, there are all sorts of methods. I'll talk to you later on as well. So if you click on modify simulation file, so here, let's start talking about this. Environment setting, you could have a very large, very small environment. Regardless, typically it's always going to be some sort of, you know, hard edged geometric rectangle or like a square of some sort. 
a lot of students also ask me, hey Joy, how do I determine what type of environment, like what the numbers are? My biggest recommendation personally from my experiences is that you should find ratios within a scientific resource. With everything cobweb, I recommend before you do any changes, find a baseline for yourself. It's similar to a control with a animal study, for example, right? You want to find something concrete to compare to so you know whether you're being subjective or not. For example, let's think about Toronto. Now, all the examples I give are going to be very inaccurate. First disclaimer, I just want to give you an example so you know how to translate it onto your own project or your own research, right? So with that being said, firstly, you might think about Toronto, okay? Now, let's say you have five agents. So that would be five unit squares, right? Because we're saying one square on the grid is going to be one unit square, right? So you have five unit square. Then maybe within that, right now I have an 80 by 80. So 80 by 80 meaning it's, you know, 6,400 squares, right? So 6,400 squares, I have five agents within that, then that means my population density, right? Let's assume it's randomly dispersed because that's what the default here is. It's randomly dispersed. The default would be 7.8125 times 10 to the negative four. That's my population density. If I wanna do something that's above 7.8125 agents per unit square, then I might wanna change it to be more representative. So it really depends on what type of ratio you personally want. If you want it to be an agent that is a certain percent, you would match it accordingly. So for example, it's just very basic math here, right? You're finding the ratio of one unit square to the area. That's how I encourage you to go about this. Usually this works very well for most students. So onwards, agent type. If you want four types of agent, so for example, you're representing four types of cells within the body interacting, then you would choose four. And what you would see is four types of triangle colors. You could have, here we have yellow, blue, red, right, and green. So with that being said, you could change this. You could change it to two. And you change it to two, and you'll only have two. You're also going to have this area. Some students make the mistake of clicking generate. I don't recommend you do that because the random seed is somewhat like the personality of it, you could kind of say. I'm telling you this to simplify it for you, obviously, but if you click generate each time, it will randomly generate something for you. So if you click generate on this, which I see some students do, that might change your baseline. So I recommend keeping it at the default. Stones, you can also change. Right now we have 10. So if we have 100 stones, then you can see a lot more stones. You know, let's go off and keep talking about the other functions.